Okay, in this video, we're going to look at some, uh, I guess, random questions from Oxford Chapter 8. And the first one here is from the first exercise set, number 9, where Sebastian is buying a raffle ticket. And they tell us 360 people at this uh, gala in total, and half of them uh, buy raffle tickets. And then it gets a bit dizzying. It says, of those who buy raffle tickets, half buy two raffle tickets, and the rest buy a single ticket. There's only one winner of the raffle. What is the probability that Sebastian will win? So I think first of all, I'm just going to try to organize some of the information to say, okay, there's 360 people at this gala, and only half of them are going to buy a raffle ticket. I'll just say raffle. Of course, the other half, I guess, do nothing. Dance, talk, whatever. Okay, so half of 360, of course, is 180. So it was 180 people that buy a raffle ticket. And then the next part of this is uh, of those who buy a raffle ticket or buy raffle tickets, half buy two and the rest buy one. So let's split this uh, 180 people up again into a pair of 90s. And of course, uh, I guess uh, these first 90 doesn't matter as long as one of these 90s, you're aware that they actually buy a pair of tickets. So I'll just say two tickets. And this is a single ticket. So please be aware, this isn't really a tree diagram, even though of course it, it looks like it. Um, we don't have to assign individual probabilities to each branch of the tree. It's just a way of organizing, at least for me, to organize the information on this question. So the probability that Sebastian wins, we have to figure out, of course, uh, how many tickets were sold. So how many tickets were sold? And if we know that and Sebastian only buys a single ticket, well, then the probability will be one out of the number of tickets sold. So how many tickets were sold. So I think obviously of these 180, 90 are buying two, so it makes sense to multiply that. And those 90 people actually buy 180 tickets, and these, single, uh, these 90 people buy a single ticket. So of course the total number of tickets sold will be uh, 2 times 90 plus 1 times 90, which of course is 270. So the probability that Sebastian wins if he buys a single ticket. It's going to be that single ticket out of the total number of tickets sold, which of course includes his ticket as well. But there's 270 tickets sold. And another, I guess, related probability. What is the probability that the answer in the back of your Oxford uh, textbook is incorrect? In this case, given that it's number 9 in chapter 8a, exercise at 8a, that probability is 100%. Uh, the wrong answer, of course, is in the back. And they say 1 out of 360, which makes absolutely no sense uh, because, of course, it's ignoring all this information about some people buying two tickets. They seem to have just taken the total number of people in the question and ignored everything else and went 1 out of 360. So please be aware the correct answer is 1 out of 270. Okay, the next question, number seven, where we're told a school has five buses uh, for transporting students. Four of them are mini buses with the same number of seats, and there's a larger bus, a large coach, which has three times the number of seats as a mini bus. A student is allocated to a bus. Uh, we would expect uh, that happens uh, randomly. And what is the probability that the student is allocated to the coach given that seats are allocated at random until all of them are filled. Okay, there's the random selection which we were looking for. And to make this much less abstract, let's say a minibus has a fixed number of seats. Let's just, and we can of course make that whatever we want. Maybe I'll say a minibus has uh, 12 seats. And that would mean the coach the big bus has three times that. There is a large coach which has three times the number of seats, so that would have to have 36 seats. So now what's the probability that if a student gets picked, uh, or I guess gets a seat chosen at random out of the total number of seats, you know, uh, what is that probability? So of course the probability of a student that lands in the coach is going to be the favorable outcomes now would be these 36 uh, seats out of the 
total number of seats. Now, I guess I've got to keep in mind there's not a single minibus here. So of all the minibus seats, there was actually four minibuses. So we have to make sure that we times this by four to get 48 minibus seats. I'll just say seats. So now we can uh, get our probability here. We'll say the probability that a student will just say gets selected to uh, sit in the coach is going to be the favorable outcomes, uh, 36. I guess I can do that in the green. That'll be 36 divided by the total number of uh, seats, which is 48 and 36. So we'll say uh, 48 plus 36. So we can finish this probability off. This will be 36 divided by 84. And we can actually divide top and bottom by, I guess, 4 at least. And probably whittle this down. If I divide 36 by 4, I will get 9. And if I divide this by 4, we will get 21. And hey, we can go a step further. I can divide top and bottom by 3. We'll get 3 sevenths, which is actually the correct probability. So there's really nothing wrong with our setup, but some people might take issue with their assumption that a minibus has 12 seats. Maybe the solution is only correct if the minibus has 12 seats, which is actually not the case, but let's just try to generalize this process a little bit. What if we, uh, I guess I'll just erase this, what if we just assign a variable to, to represent the number of seats that's on a minibus? So I'll say a minibus has, of course, x seats. And then how many uh, seats is a coach going to have? Well, it's three times as much. That'll be 3x. And then I have to remind myself yet again, there are four minibuses. So I'm going to have to times that x by 4. There's going to be 4x seats available uh, that are minibus seats. And of course, there's only going to be 3x seats available for the coach. So again, these are still our favorable, I guess this is our favorable uh, outcomes, or representing our favorable outcomes, so our probability here down below, a little more, uh, I guess, generalized, but it still will give us the same answer. Favorable outcomes is going to be, sorry, I was going to say 36 again, but I meant to say 3x, and we'll divide that by the total number of seats you can see now, of course, is, I guess I could color code it, that's 4x plus the uh, 3x. And this actually simplifies maybe a little bit nicer. This is going to be 3x on the top and 7x on the bottom. So, of course, it doesn't matter uh, what, we, uh, what number of seats the minibus has, which is our x. They're going to cancel anyway. So this reduces down is three sevenths and this might be a little more mathematically rigorous but of course I don't have any issues or problems with you assigning a specific number of seats to your minibus and calculating this probability that way like I did initially we're still going to get three sevenths but at least you have I guess two options available to you now. Okay, our next question is number five from exercise 8c, where we are given a universal set, which is our sample space, numbers 1 through 10, and we have a couple of subsets here. Uh, set A seems to be the even numbers from our universal set, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and then we have another subset B, which is 3, 6, and 9, uh, the multiples of 3, and then we need to list the members of the following sets. So we have some... Uh, some uh, intersection symbols there and we also have some unions uh, but before we get to that just uh, I guess to clarify a couple of things with set notation I guess first of all if you're dealing with sets you got to use your curly brackets and the numbers or the items I mean it could be letters or anything else in a set but of course in this example we're dealing only with numbers uh, but each of these uh, items in our set is referred to as an element so if you see this n notation it's just simply saying how many elements are in this set. So in our universal set, of course, that would be 10, the numbers 1 through 10. How many numbers are in A, or how many elements, I should be saying, in A? There's five numbers, 2, 4, 6, and 8, and we could also figure out how many elements are in B. There's three elements in B. Now, of course, this n notation comes in handy if we were calculating probabilities. We could say the probability of A 
would be the number of elements in A, which we have here is 5 out of the uh, divided by the total number of elements in our sample space or our universal set. And of course, that's 10. And then you could clue in that, hey, the probability of selecting uh, something in that number in that subset A is precisely 5 out of 10 or 1 half. So all that notation is helpful uh, when we are dealing with probabilities, which is actually not the case here because they just want us to list some sets, actually quite a few of those sets. So when you're just being asked to write out uh, A, and I guess we better do a recap of this notation as well. This symbol is the AND symbol. It's called the intersection. in uh, probability and I guess set theory and it's easy to remember because if you just go A that symbol in D you can remember that that means and so that has to be uh, if you any number that's uh, in both of these subsets A and B would be in the intersection and we're going to organize that all as you can probably tell in a Venn diagram in a few moments and just as another recap this is our OR symbol so if you know that's and, the other thing has to be or. And this is actually an either, or, or possibly both. We sometimes call this a the inclusive or in set theory and probability. Meaning that if there's a number in both sets, of course, it's, it gets counted. Not doubly counted, but included as well. So maybe just a little bit of shading here. Let's uh, highlight the intersection uh, in our Venn diagram above. So what is the intersection up here? Let's see if I can spray paint in there. This is the intersection of A and B. And if I say, what's the union of A and B? Of course, that would be, uh, I guess we can use a different color. This is going to take a while. <laughs> Let's turn up the ink flow a bit here. There we go. So notice it'll be everything in both of those circles. Now, of course, you can faintly see that I've overlapped that uh, an intersection twice. So when you're dealing with your union, just make sure you include everything, uh, every element, every number that's in both circles, and just make sure you don't count that overlap twice. Okay, so I think we'll clear off everything here now and start to organize our Venn diagram. I think we got a good uh, overview of set, at least the relevant parts of set theory uh, for probability, and of course a little quick introduction possibly of the AND and OR uh, symbols as well. So A and B is letter A, and that's always your first uh, step with the Venn diagram, is figure out what elements are common to both sets. And if we're dealing with even numbers here and multiples of three, we can clue in that in a different color that we can see, that six is the element that's common to both of these subsets, A and B. And then we just do some inventory. We figure out what numbers are, are in A, but also not in the overlaps. So of course, that's going to be two. Four, we already got six, and include eight and ten, as long as you're in the A only part of this uh, Venn diagram as well. So just to be clear, and get set up again with some spray painting. Um, this section right here is the A only. All right, so avoid your six. Okay, and similarly, uh, this section over here is the B only. And I think those might be the trickiest parts of your Venn diagram. Okay, so maybe I'll leave that spray paint on there. I think I can still see my uh, numbers in there. So let's go back now to doing some inventory and say, okay, I got the now focusing on the B circle. I got six looked after, and of course, I still have to find a home for the elements three and nine, and that's in our yellow B only section. And then if you count up our elements, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I have seven elements accounted for. I am missing three because there's, of course, 10 items in our 10, 10 elements in our universal set. And we're missing one, five, and seven. And it doesn't matter where you're placing these uh, numbers exactly, as long as you're outside of the subsets A and B or outside of the circles. Now with all that detail and organization done, we can probably just kind of churn through these uh, six questions here. So the overlap, so again, we're being asked to write out the actual set. So we've got to use our curly brackets and write out all elements that are in our overlap. And of course, that's just the number six. So one down. Letter B is the union. So write out every single number that's in the union. And of course, take some care not to count that six twice. So I'll be a little lazy here. I'll just say two, four, six, eight. 
oh, and 10. Make sure all the even numbers in this uh, sample space, and then I'll just tack on uh, 3 and 9. And of course, I probably should sort that, but that's still, that's still okay. You don't have to sort elements in a set. Set can be in any, any order. So uh, again, with the union, just make sure you don't write that 6 down twice, because even though orders, uh, sorting is not necessary with a set, you definitely don't want repetition of elements. That's actually not correct in set theory. So we got 2 down. The next one is the complement of A. And sometimes you see that written as a little c, and sometimes even with a line over it as well. So we'll just focus with the stick notation here, and please uh, don't have some flashbacks to differential calculus. This has nothing to do with the derivative here. In this context, that stick has to mean complement. So write out the elements that aren't in A, and if you clue in A is the set of even numbers from 1 to 10, then we just have to write down the odd numbers 1 through 10. So of course, it's 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. And maybe I can squeeze D down here. We got letter D now, which things are getting a little more interesting, but we have to pinpoint. Now this is a, an and symbol, so we've got to have elements that are not in A and in B. So I like to use a check mark uh, procedure here when I'm doing this. So I would say first, and I guess I better write out the question down here, or I guess the label, the name of this set. So we've got to figure out what no elements are not in A and they're also in B. Now you can probably just look here and figure it out and you might not even need the Venn to do this so we have to make sure we stay out of the A circle but we also need to be in the B circle so that means we're in the yellow section here and if you see that right away you can just say 3 and 9 are the two elements that are not in the A circle but they're still in the B circle. You don't have to use this check mark method but I'll still show it to you so you go through these individual sets and you check off the elements. And actually, I'm just going to check off the four regions here. There's the A only, there's the B only, there's the overlap, and then the fourth section, of course, is outside of both circles. So uh, what's the uh, not A uh, part of our Venn diagram? And I'll pick a color that stands out here. So not A would be uh, the 3 and the 9 elements, and of course the 1, 5, and 7. Those would be the two regions that are included in this first portion, not A. And then the second part is we've got to be in the B circles. So of course, that would include 6, would also include the B only, 3 and 9. And with the check mark procedure, and if it's an and, I guess I should highlight that, anything checked with red is, of course, in the B subset. Uh, with an and, uh, with this intersection symbol, you're looking for your uh, double check marks. You can see that uh, 3 and 9 are the, is the only, uh, in the region uh, that received, I guess, a check mark both times. So of course, that's being aware that we're using an and, and we have to have uh, uh, both, I guess, the elements we choose have to be in, not in an either or, but both of these sets. Okay, so we got maybe I'll just undo those check marks and clean those off okay so now we got two more left a lot of questions here and they kind of get repetitive but anyway we're almost done we have now a union between A and not B so again a union is an either or or both so you can take any element that's in the A circle which of course is 2 4 6 8 10 you can also take numbers that aren't in the B circle which would be 1, 5, and 7. So if you recognize what your answer is, you can go ahead and write it down. But I think I'll just uh, try to clarify here with the check mark procedure again. Well, actually, I think I'll write out my answer first, because then I won't be able to undo. Okay, so numbers that are either in the A circle, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, or they could also be not in B as well. So that would mean... Uh, we are going to take uh, 1, 5, and 7. We can't take 3 and 9, or I guess technically 6 in the second part because that's all in the B. So we would take uh, anything that's not in B, uh, which I guess is uh, 2, 4, 8, 10. I better include those again, but I already got those accounted for. And then 1, 5, and 7. So the only new elements we pick up, of course, 1, 5, and 7. But just to be super clear, not B is anything outside of our B circle, which includes that pink shaded region as well. Okay, so let's try our check mark procedure as well. And with the union, anything that gets checked off gets included uh, in that set as well. So anything that's in the A circle, which is the A only, and of course the intersection, 
And then for not B, we have to uh, take maybe a different color. We'll say not B is anything outside of that B circle. And don't hone in on the double check mark. That would be for an and, where you'd have to make sure the elements are in both sets. But it, with this either or, or possibly both here, anything that receives a single check mark or two check marks gets included. And of course, that's everything except for three and nine, uh, which we have listed here. Okay, so now I can undo those check marks. And we got one more. This kind of tedious question. But we have a list of elements that aren't in A or aren't in B. So anything that's not in A, which is 3, 6, 1, 5, 7, sorry, 3, 9, 1, 5, 7, and then anything that's not in B is uh, 2, 4, 8, and 10, and 1, 5, 7. And if you can keep track that we seem to be avoiding the 6 here, um, then you can probably just write down your set, and that's a pretty crummy uh, union symbol, so I think I'll try to do a little better with that. Looks a little more like a union symbol. And then let's just do our check mark procedure here and be done with this. So anything that's not in A, take pink. Uh, this isn't in A, and these uh, numbers aren't in A. And then anything that's also not in B, and of course uh, these numbers aren't in B. And these numbers aren't in B. So anything that receives a single check, not the double check mark, remember, that would be the 157. If that was an intersection, the answer of the set would be 157. Uh, but this is an either or. And of course, the only number we seem to be missing is that intersection or element that's in that intersection. So I think I'll just list off one, two, three, four, Five, avoid six, the only number that's not included in this set of not A or not B. And then we'll be at seven, eight, nine, and ten. Now, incidentally, uh, Oxford, uh, true to form, has a wrong answer in the back, and I believe it's letter D where they come up with some kind of random wrong uh, answer for that one. Uh, so three and, and nine was the correct set for uh, letter D. Okay, so our last question here uh, from exercise 8D is number 7, and it deals exclusively with probabilities. And we are told A and B are two events, such that the probability of A occurring is 3 sixteenths, and the probability that B occurs is 3 eighths. And it is known that the probability of the union of A and B is precisely three times the probability of the intersection of A and B. And then we're being asked, of course, to find a couple of probabilities there. Well, that's a lot to take in. And I guess just a little bit of background information. Uh, we really, uh, uh <coughs> oh, come on, Edwin, I need to take a break. Okay, our last question here in this video is from exercise 8D, and it's question number 7. And we are told A and B are two events, such that the probability of A is 3 sixteenths, and the probability of B is 3 eighths. And it is known that the probability of the union of these events is precisely three times the probability of the intersection. And then we're being asked to find three different probabilities. So I think my goal is possibly to uh, fill in this Venn diagram here, which is usually uh, something that's helpful when you're dealing with probabilities. But before we deal with that, we're going to have to find our intersection. Anytime you're working with a Venn, if you can get the intersection figured out, in this case the probability of the intersection, uh, things just tend to fall in place like dominoes. So we have to use what's called the rule of sum here or the rule of addition. Uh, and before we deal with that, we're going to actually go back and look at something called the inclusion-exclusion principle and use this uh, not probability notation, but this number of elements in each set notation. So if we uh, had the number of elements in A or B, of course that's anything in our circles here. Now we don't know anything about sets A and B. We don't even know how many elements each of them have. We definitely don't know what the elements are, but if we did, we could of course scatter them all about uh, in our Venn diagram here. And if we wanted to count the number of elements that occur inside our circles, we could go through and count anything that's occurring uh, any element that occurs in the A circle, we could also count up the number of elements that's in our B circle. And we'd have to take some care, though, that if there were elements in the overlap, that we don't want to count those twice. 
So we have to subtract away the number of elements that, of course, would occur in that intersection. Now, if there weren't actually any uh, elements in the intersection, well, we'd be subtracting zero, and this wouldn't be wrong. But this is probably set up that we would expect that there's probably at least one element that is in the intersection. So how is this helpful here? Well, if we convert this into a probability, these are just the number of, of elements that are in each of these sets above. So if I divide everything, by the number of elements in this entire sample space. And I can use S or I can use capital U. I think here I'll just opt for capital S. If we divide everything by the number of elements in our sample space, we could just convert these different numbers into probabilities. And this is called the rule of sum or the addition rule in probability, where this is now the probability of the union this, of course, the number, number of outcomes or elements, I guess I should say, in uh, subset A divided by the total number of elements in the entire sample space, of course, is the probability of A favorable outcomes divided by total outcomes. Same with this one. This is the favorable outcomes would be anything in B. So this is the probability of B. And this last one is the probability of the intersection. Now we're getting somewhere. And of course, if you are familiar with the rule of sum, you already would have wrote it down and you're probably well on your way to working on the solution. But if you never seen this before, hopefully that was uh, that obviously wouldn't have been time that was wasted. So this is our rule of sum. And right away, I know that we uh, have a probability of a. So just as a mental note, I'll say, well, I know this and I know the probability of B. I have to come to terms with the fact that I don't know my intersection and part A here is asking me to find the probability of the union. I can't until I find the probability of the intersection. So not surprisingly, this whole question relies on this little tidbit of information here where we are told the union, you can cross this off, is exactly three times the intersection. Okay, so that's going to allow us to solve this equation and I guess not really solve this equation it is an equation but solve for the probability of our uh, intersection here so instead of just crossing that off I think I'll just get rid of that and replace my union with three times the intersection you can move that up and then while I'm at it and moving stuff here we'll erase these two probabilities because we actually know those and we'll put in three sixteenths for the probability of a and what was it three eighths for the probability of B. So now we can uh, just treat this probability of A and B as, uh, as a variable. And you can literally replace it with the variable if you wish. You could put X in there. And I could actually now just say, if this is a little more, I guess, familiar to you, I could say three times that probability labeled in our Venn diagram above is equal to uh, 3 sixteenths and 3 eighths subtract exactly one of those overlaps. So now I can add x to both sides and we'll get four of those x's would have to be equal to the sum of 3 sixteenths and 3 eighths. So we got some fraction work to do, not surprisingly here because that was the presentation to begin with. So I think we will just uh, get 4x or just rewrite 4x and maybe just get a common denominator on the right hand side which isn't that difficult to do because we just need to double the bottom and of course the top to get a common denominator of 16 so this will be now this fra these the sum of these two fractions will be 3 plus 6 all over 16 so that's going to be 9 sixteenths and then to get x by itself we're going to multiply both sides by the reciprocal of 4 or divide both sides by 4 but multiplying by 1 over 4 is a little bit easier dealing with your fractions. And that means that the overlap, or I should say the probability of the overlap, is going to be equal to 9 over 64. Okay, And then maybe just, I guess I shouldn't write it there for because I feel like I'm answering a question, which I'm not. We haven't gotten to part A yet. We will get there. But just to make sure you're clear what this x is, and I'm sure you are, this is the probability of the overlap is 9 over 64. Eureka! So I can go up top, get rid of that little unknown, and replace it with a fraction of 9 over 64. 
So we know that the probability of, you know, selecting a, an element at random from this sample space, the probability that we get something in the intersection is 9 out of 64. Doesn't necessarily mean that we have 64 elements in the whole sample space, but that could be an interpretation of it. Of course, we could have had like 18 over 128, which reduces to 9 over 64. But let's just say we know that probability of the intersection, and that is definitely a starting point. So now, clear all this off, use this space again, and replace this back with the more typical and more usual probability of the union. And we're now getting to finally part A, first of three questions. So now that I know the probability of A and B, I can replace this with the 9 sixteenths. Sorry, 9 over 64, not 9 sixteenths. And then just figure out what these fractions are uh, added and subtracted. So of course we're going to get a common denominator of 64 again. So I'm going to times this by 4 over 4, this by 8 over 8, and then I don't have to do anything, of course, to uh, 9 over 64. So these fractions will now become 12 over 64 plus 24 over 64 minus 9 over 64. So the probability of our union here is going to be 36 minus 9 over 64, uh, which is 27. So our final answer here, the probability of the uh, union occurring in this sample space is 27 out of 64. Now if you want, it's not necessary because hey, we got the correct answer here for part A, you might actually want to fill in your Venn diagram and be my guest if you feel that is helpful. And especially if we consider these uh, converted fractions and where they're written out of uh, 64. So now I can clue in that the probability of A is 12 out of 64. And if I look at the A circle, I already have nine of those 64s present here. So the probability of the A only part of our Venn diagram would have to be 3 out of 64. So I can add those two probabilities together to get 12 over 64, of course 3 sixteenths. And then uh, converting the, P, the B a probability from 3 eighths to 24 over 64, we can recognize that we're missing 15 64ths here in the B only part of our Venn diagram. Uh, checking my addition here, yes, 24 out of 64 if we add up both of those probabilities, which will reduce to 3 eighths. And then knowing that I have 27 uh, out of 64 accounted for, we're obviously still missing uh, some uh, probability, or one probability here, probability of not being in any of those circles. And of course, if I just go 64 minus 27, I can figure out what I'm left with after uh, dealing, I guess, accounting for 27 of those 64ths already. And I guess we could just, what, add 3 to both of those. We could say 67 over uh, 30. It's the same difference and we'll get 37 out of 64 is the probability of uh, not being in either one of those uh, two or of, I guess either one of those events happening outside of both circles and some of those numbers might be helpful and you might just opt to do it all algebraically I guess speaking using your rule of addition here but the Venn diagram is typically a pretty useful tool in probability. So let's maybe just clear off a little bit of space here and I'll write my final answer here 27 out of 64 and then we'll uh, hopefully wrap up here two more questions left so and we have our Venn filled in so we shouldn't uh, have too much of an obstacle I guess left in front of us so the probability of not in the union it's like hey probability of not being in either circle we already have that from above so just to get you used to the some of the notation here that if you want to use that complement notation with the stick that's fine you could also use that line and a lot of people would say that's going to be 1 minus the probability of the union occurring. Make sure you use your union symbol and not the upside down U intersection, the union. And this, of course, would be 1 minus 27 over 64. And I guess I'm just showing you that you wouldn't have to fill in your VIN. Because guess what? If you know 100% of your sample space is left, 
uh, or sorry, that your whole sample space represents one or 100 percent if you remove uh, 27 over 64. And of course, you're going to get the probability of being outside of the circle here. And not surprisingly, we're going to have to go 64 over 64 instead of 1 and subtract 27 over 64. And we'll get exactly the same answer without taking the time, I guess, to fill in our VEN. And now we have one more. We want the probability of A and not B. So here's where, in my opinion, the VEN really pays off. Because if you can recognize what region you're in in your Venn diagram, this is a pretty trivial calculation. And if you don't have your Venn filled in, I guess good luck with this question. Uh, so all that's left for us to do here is uh, figure out uh, what region, I guess, in our Venn corresponds to A and not B. So this is an AND. So first of all, which part of the Venn corresponds to A? It would be both of these regions, uh, which of course corresponds to the probabilities 3 out of 64 and 9 out of 64. And then uh, the not B, we have to make sure we are outside of B. So we would consider both of these regions and both of these probabilities. And since this is an AND, and of course we go with the double check mark. So the probability of A and not B is precisely 3 out of 64 and if you don't like my check mark procedure I guess you could just reason your way through it but I kind of like the check mark procedure it's a little safer I think for most people but if you understand this is an and and you have to make sure both of these features are I guess looked after uh, a be in the a circle but stay clear of the B which means be in the a and sidestep your intersection in either way your final answer will be 3 out of 64 for part C